Saddam had a lot of bad ideas, but he knew how to do a good banknote. I'll tell you. Let's see if you look like him. I think there's a certain likeness. If you there's grow a moustache, I think there's a certain likeness, actually. Definitely. Yeah. Just a little, little thing like that. Me looking yeah. nobly into the distance, clearly loved. Yes. I'm 28 years old and I live in Bow, East London. Well, kind of. You see, a little over six months ago, I decided to start my very own country. Things were going very well. So far, I'd secured a territory. I have started my own country. You are sitting in it. Formed a government. Cheers. 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 To the government. To the government and, and the king, really, as well. And managed to persuade thousands of people to become my citizens. Best of all, I'd written a lovely letter to the Prime Minister, and as yet, the British government hadn't objected to my flat becoming an independent state. In fact, my biggest problem to date was money, or the lack of it. I'd been so busy setting up my country, I completely lost track of my finances. And the bills were stacking up. So, my problem is, I'm in debt. Right. As my finance minister was on holiday, my friend Mike offered to step in and lend a hand. Well, what countries tend to do when they get in debt is uh, sell things. So, for instance, um, like Saudi Arabia uh, has got oil. Have you got any oil? Brazil uh, has got nuts. Have you got any nuts? No, not that I can sell. Well, this is your kingdom. What can you sell? Crown. Crown, do you not need that as leader? What else can I... I've got a little dog and a bottle of booze. Right, OK. Uh, I've got this. It's like a little gun. Does that. Monopoly. I've got, like, a coaster chariot. Cracking. Right. This is quite an impressive display. Should we start adding things up? So, I mean, the chariot... The chariot coaster set. Chariot coaster set. Oh, 75p. 75 pence? Yeah. For that? Yeah. Look at it again with your eyes. No, I'm thinking 65 pence. Come on, that's two quid? Two? The small dog. I'm thinking 20p. I got it from a pound shop. I'm still thinking 20p. I Round it up to a off. pound. Round it up to a pound. A pound. Good. The booze. 80p. Two pounds. So that comes to... According to our calculations, we could make anything between £4.19 and 28 quid. It is rubbish. How much for the calculator? If I was going to sort out my country's economy, I needed to get some professional advice. I hooked up with a man who helps governments figure out ways of solving their financial problems. His name is Madsen Piri, and he works for the Adam Smith Institute. Nice to meet you. How's it going? Hey, it's pretty good, isn't it? Should you take a seat? I told Madsen all about not having anything to sell, but he didn't seem to think it was a problem. Yes, Adam Smith was the, um, the Scottish writer who more than 200 years ago uh, set out the entire principles of, of modern economics. It was a book called uh, The Wealth of Nations, and he basically said that uh, your wealth isn't the number of gold bars you've got hidden under the, under, the, under the throne room. It's the productive labor of your people. It's the goods and services they're producing for each other. That's what makes a country rich. Right. Well, I don't really know what my, my people could be producing. I mean, they're kind of, they're dotted around the place. How big is your country? Uh, it's about the size of a standard uh, London flat. Right. About the only thing you could manufacture in a country that size would be software. You could have 15 teenagers at computers designing new computer software and computer games. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this stems from the fact that I got an electricity bill the other day, and it's quite a hefty one. You could establish your own tax. Britain has a, a very complex tax system with a variety of rates. 
Um, almost certainly, if we just uh, said everyone below 10,000 pays no tax at all, everyone above 10,000 a year, you're taxed at 20% flat rate on everything. You watch, this economy would grow like the clappers. But I feel a bit bad if I was taxing them for not really that much in return. Well, you've got the option of making your country a tax haven as far as possible. That is, keeping taxes uh, so low, so sufficiently attractive to lure them there rather than somewhere else. The rule is basically, if you want to be attractive, you keep your taxes low and you keep them simple. Well, simple's good for me. It, it worked for Hong Kong in the first place, just after World War II, yes. Fist set up a flat tax. And it's so popular, that, I mean, look, look what happened. Hong Kong went from a poverty-stricken enclave with no natural resources to being one of the richest nations on earth. And it's I wasn't sure my country was destined to become one of the richest nations on earth, but I did like the idea that my citizens could work for the country and help me pay off the debt. I'm a scientist, so I've got lots of ideas for making this great new land into the technological capital of the world. Back at the flat, I looked at my citizen applications to see what they had to offer. Also, I've just got a spirit level with a laser on it, and I think it could be useful. I spent a term at college learning how to make pretty bowls and tiles out of glass. I was very good at it. My teacher said so. My citizens seemed keen to help, but I was worried that if I started taxing them, they'd all leave the country. Desperate to avoid such a calamity, I grabbed a cheap flight to a place with a reputation for having no tax. Covering less than a square mile, Monaco is one of the smallest countries in the world. It's also one of the wealthiest. I like the shiny cars. That's the first thing I'm noticing. Amazing. You always know a place is posh. If the trees just don't look like trees. This is like a, one of the popsicles, but in tree form. Ah, oh, This is what I need. Look at this. Oh, there's boats. There's men in uniform. There's flags. There's a big mountain. That's not a very impressive boat. I think that's probably like the kind of boat I'd have if I lived here. This is nice. More posh cars. Porsches. Mercs. Beamers. Oh, someone's letting the side down. I feel like writing them a note, you know, going, don't you know where you are? Look at this. It's even, it's been bashed. But how does the government manage to pay the bills without taking money from its citizens? I met up with Monaco's Minister for Finance, Frank Biancheri. So I've been having a look around. It seems like everyone's got an incredible lifestyle. Yes. But how, how is that possible? I think one of the major key of our success was to establish here in Monaco a very diversified economy. We can live uh, as well as we can because of the presence of all these investors who trust Monaco, who came here in order to uh, invest their money. And I know that people often believe that we were successful because people here don't pay taxes. I mean, it is low tax here, isn't it? Did you abolish income tax? No, there are no taxes for individuals right. except for French citizens and American citizens. I mean, if there isn't any income tax, how do you pay for health or how do you pay for... Because there are taxes for uh, companies and you probably not know that uh, the budget, the total income of the budget is around 640 million euros and more than 75% of this total income are paid by taxes, added value taxes and corporate taxes. Uh -huh. Part of this income, of course, is dedicated, dedicated to uh, health, dedicated to police, to trans public transportation. Gosh. You don't know that. I didn't I'm know sure that, you're no. surprised. But I like the idea about taxing Americans. Why? I just think <laughs> it's about time. It sounded like the perfect solution. Tax-wise, They know what they're doing in Monaco. They've done very well, they've thought it through, credit where it's due, and um, I'd like to emulate, well, I'd like to copy it. I mean, they tax businesses, they tax Americans, and they tax the French, and they don't tax anyone else. So on paper, perfect. Apart from, I haven't got any businesses, I haven't got any Americans, and I've got no French. It's not really going to help me very much. But 
I do get to tax the French. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, really. Clearly, this was a solution for the future. In the meantime, I'd need to come up with a short-term plan to help me get the country on its feet. After a bit of research, I found that wealthy countries like Britain sometimes give out grants to developing countries like mine. In fact, last year alone, the British government gave just under £4,000 million to help other countries out. I managed to get a meeting with the government minister responsible, Hilary Benn. It's his job to choose who gets the money, and I'd been granted ten minutes to put my case forward. We're giving out a lot of, a lot of grants, a lot of aid lately for developing nations. So all the signs are we're onto a winner. Hello, how's it going? I'm Danny. Very nice to meet you. Nice I'm to Hillary. meet you. I mean, I'll cut to the chase. I know yeah. you're a busy man. I'm a developing nation. I'm looking to boost my economy, uh, build my infrastructure. Um, how do you know you're a developing nation? Because uh, I haven't finished yet. But how, how do you know about the economic circumstances of your, of your citizens? Well, well, I've asked how much about, do they earn? Uh, well, there aren't any really big earners. Are they living in poverty? Uh, what's poverty, then? Well, poverty is people who haven't got enough money to eat, children who die of diseases that you and I would get treated for because we live in a country where we've got a good functioning health service. 30,000 people who die every week from malaria, for example, around the world. I call that poverty, don't you? Mm, yeah, no, that, yeah, that is worse than... So any of, your, any of your citizens dying of malaria? I don't suppose so. No, there's no... Well, not that I've, there aren't, there's no malaria. Right, OK. It's not a problem anyway. OK, all right. So, I mean, so in terms of developing... that, You're kind of saying to me that I'm not a developing nation, even though, you know, very little's in place, there's no real infrastructure. I mean, that, to me, is quite developing. Well, the, the things that we would take into account in deciding whether to give overseas aid would be, are all, your, are all the children in your country in primary education? There's 104 million children around the world today who didn't have a classroom, a desk, a teacher, a textbook. Why? Because they don't go to school. So that's the first thing. Um, to what extent do the children in your country die of wholly preventable diseases before they reach their fifth birthday? A billion people around the world today didn't have a, a glass of clean water to drink. A billion? A billion people don't have access to clean and safe water. I mean, those are the kind of questions that I'd be asking of you. Yeah, I mean, my answers would probably um, not qualify me for aid. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of realising now. It turned out that due to the wealth of my citizens, my country was already considered to be one of the richest nations on Earth. But that didn't help me with how much it was costing to get the country on its feet. But inspiration was near. The government has been assured. I found out about a man named Prince Lazarus, a fellow visionary also starting his own country. That is genius. Lazarus had come up with a very simple way of getting his project off the ground. In order to become invited to become a citizen, you pay $25,000. Imagine how much I could have made if I'd been... Wow! I set up a meeting to see if I could find out more. As the Paradise Island is still in the planning stages, Utopia's UK office is currently a semi-detached house in Ipswich. There we have it. New Utopia. Hello. Hiya, Tony. Oh. Danny, Hello. nice to meet you. Right, How's it going? Yet. The UK rep is Tony Nicodemus, and he'd agreed to fill me in. Indeed. Now, straight away, I can see the flag. Is that the flag of New Utopia? That's the flag of the Principality of New Utopia. <laughs> Shall we take a seat then, and yeah. I can show you some documentation. The territory has been secured, and it, there is a, a sub-oceanic mountain range, yeah, which is known as the Mysteriosa Bank. The top part of the mountain uh, is between 12 and 60 foot below uh, the water level. Right. So they're going to sink some concrete pylons into the uh, mountain range yeah. and then put concrete platforms on top. Yeah? Right. Uh, and lo and behold, you have your building foundations there for, got an island, for, for buildings. Yeah, quite a few countries have already recognised New Utopia. The, Who, who's already recognised you? Uh, there's a, a country called Thermaturgy, which is a, no, there's not. Yes, there is indeed. Thermaturgy. Thermaturgy. There's no yes. country called Thermaturgy. Yes, indeed. Either. Thermaturgy. Principality of Thermaturgy, which is a, a the somewhere of off, somewhere off China, somewhere. Yes, I've indeed. Never heard yeah. Of thermaturgy. Now, if you just hold on to that. Here we have the um, entrance into uh, New Utopia. You see the, 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 the arch fountain there, basically in the globe, yeah? Here you've got the palace, yeah? And the government house. That's not bad. Wouldn't we like to live there? Not huh? exactly. Okay. While the plans for New Utopia yeah. were very impressive, 
I had my reservations. Of course, yeah. What happens if, for some reason, yes, it didn't happen? I mean, I know it will. Well, but... the money that, that's been committed hasn't actually been spent or invested. So, yet. so these back. developers haven't actually said, here's the money. They've said, we've committed, we've given our letter of intention, this is what we're going to build, this is what we're going to do, this is uh, how much we're going to spend to do it. Yeah. yeah. So no money has course, changed hands? No money has changed hands as far as that. And is as that true as with as you as well? Did you, have you paid that, has that money gone out of your account? For the invitation to become invitation. a citizen, of course. Yeah. Right. That, that is a And what happens if it doesn't, what, what happens if it doesn't happen? Well, if it doesn't happen, it's a, it basically is a contribution that you've made to the government of New Utopia. Oh, you on. haven't actually paid for your citizenship. Really? You've contributed an amount of money, which is set at a minimum $1,500. Yeah? That sounds a bit like a get-out clause to me, though. Not really, because it's a contribution. It's like when you make a contribution to a worthy cause. You don't go back to the, the, the charity then and say, um, I want my contribution back. It's a contribution that you've made. Mm. And if for any reason it doesn't happen, it's, it's, it's not, not through the lack of trying, of course, yeah? Right. Uh, and all, the, all of those people that are, are involved in the project, yeah, have put in a lot of time and a lot of effort to make it a reality. Unlike New Utopia, I didn't have any amazing plans to build a luxury island. Bye-bye. To be honest, I didn't have any plans at all. Bye. Bye. And I wasn't sure my citizens would consider that value for money. There had to be another way. Ken Clark had spent four years managing the UK's economy as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Hello there. Hello, how's it you? You too. If anyone could help, I figured it was him. I'm kind of starting on the wrong foot, in a sense. I've, I've, I had a big bill recently, meaning I'm already in debt. Surely that's not a good way to start a country. Well, all nations need some credit, particularly if you've got to import your oil, you've got to import your commodities, you've got to engage in trade with other people. A reasonable level of national debt is inevitable. Every country has one. Every country, thing, every country's in debt. As far as I'm aware, I'm not, a, not aware of any country in the world that is completely free of debt. We had a pretty enormous national debt in this country since Pitt got himself into a lot of wars at the end of the 18th century. The question is whether your debt is affordable. Where countries get into trouble, like Argentina recently, is they pile up debts and have to tell everybody, sorry boys, this is far too big, we can't pay any interest. That, that does lasting damage for quite a long time to your economy. So I shouldn't fear the debt that I'm in? I should not in itself, it. no. I mean, even citizens in their private lives shouldn't necessarily fear debt. The important thing is that the debt should not get too high in relation to your income. And why is debt inevitable, sorry? Your bills go up and down. Mm. And you can't always predict uh, when suddenly your tax income is going to drop or in terms of trade they're going to go against you. So you need debt to, to, to smooth out the ups and downs that otherwise go on. Uh, Britain, the government's in debt for about a third of the national uh, income, the national income each year. I think it's about £450 billion. £450 billion? 450,000 million pounds. It's, it's all right as long as you can afford the interest, 20 odd billion. Uh, the interest is, is how much? 20 odd billion. £20 billion? Pounds. Yeah. Problems arise because it's going up. And then, then you're starting to trouble. But, but don't worry. The, the, trouble? The, 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 the Jap- That's like, that must be... Well, the Japanese are in big trouble because... And the Italians aren't doing too well. They, 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 they owe more than 100% of their entire GDP. The 100%? Problem, the problem, the other thing is you've got to keep an eye on what your population's borrowing. The British consumer is borrowing over a trillion pounds... And I didn't know there was a trillion well. pounds. I didn't know that existed. Don't, don't worry. I've been a finance minister for a few years, and a trillion means almost nothing to me. You're reaching the stage where, as you see the noughts on the page, this, you're, you're now dealing with a, a kind of concept. But geez, I- Ken had convinced me that it was actually OK to be in debt. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and when I got home, I looked at my bill in a very different light. Wicked. In fact... If I was ever to convince the world I was a proper country, I should probably hang on to it. But what if there was an easier way to kickstart my economy? What if I had my own currency? Britain has the pound, America has the dollar. It seemed only right that I had something for my country. But how could I make my money worth more than the paper it was printed on? I thought of this. I mean, what is that? That's just, you know, a bit of paper with, with some money written on it. And, and yet, when you're playing Monopoly, this is power. 
This is this is control. This is standing. And I know that outside of a game of Monopoly, it's not really worth much. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, head down the bakers and buy a baguette with that. But if I can create something like this, which means something in my country, I could have money. A little picture of me looking quite quite happy yet noble. And I could just say, right, this is now money. Problem was, I had nothing to support the value of my currency. I had no oil. I had no gold. I didn't even have a decent set of cutlery. I'd spent so much time trying to solve the problem. It made me realise there was something I did have. Right. How about this? Let me just write something down for you. I think I've worked out something pretty cool. Time is money. Time is money and money is time. They are a collective, they're together. So, what is money? Well, money is time. I'm not sure I'm making myself clear. That's what I've worked out. And I'm trying to say, but what if the one thing me and my citizens share is time? And we've all got a bit of time. Everyone's got a bit of spare time. What if we base the currency on time? So, let's say someone says, I can give you an hour of my time to help with the country. Bang, you get a certificate, that's your currency. The currency is a certificate. The thing, I want to call them IOUs, you know, because IOU a bit of time, um, IOU a bit of money. Well, they're the same. So they would give me an hour, and I'd say, here you are, here's 60 IOUs. Now trade that with other people, and then they could say, well, look, I've got some washing up needs done. Uh, my little sister broke her leg skydiving. I don't know, she needs some help around the house. You can give her some help. It's brilliant. Keen to develop my idea with someone in the know, I got in touch with a man who'd helped develop another new currency, the euro. Professor Mundell, thank you for agreeing to meet with me. Professor Robert Mundell is so clever, he'd even managed to get himself a Nobel Prize for economics. I think I've kind of decided that I need a currency for my country. Well, you have a currency. Well, I was using the pound until very recently, yeah. and then I decided um, I I'd develop my own thing. Well, look, I've I'll show you what I've... I was sitting there and I was thinking I could do it and I've kind of, I'm not brilliant with economics or maths or anything like that. Um, I've called it the, the Interdependent Occupational Unit or IOU. <laughs> yeah. And what have I got? I was just doing some designs until quite late. And it was just kind of, I just thought this is what you know it could look. I was getting quite excited. I was thinking it would be good to have these things because it would kind of define my country and it would mean that my country was different. From, from all the others. Yes. Um, yes and we yes. Can trade with each yes, other. Yes, I can see that. But if more currencies there are, the worse people are off. We don't need many currencies. We only need really one currency in the world. Like a world currency? Yes, yes. Every tiny little island in the Caribbean and the Pacific have their own currency systems, and they're all junk currencies of no value whatsoever, except that they're an expression of nationalism and of the ego of the often dictator or tyrant of the uh, community. Well, I guess that's, I mean, part of it's egotistical for me, but not all of it, you know. You create a piece of paper like this, and uh, if this is a note, you can put on it whatever you want to say, but what, what determines its value is what it sells for. And yeah. Right now, this wouldn't sell for anything. You wouldn't wouldn't get uh, as much as the worth of the paper that it's written on. Well, I mean, what kind? Although of it's quite a nice design. It's all that. It's all right, isn't it? I'm not saying anything yeah, yeah. <laughs> uncomfortable about your uh, your arts yeah. and craftsmanship well, and making. Much. It's very nice. Good. But, uh, the one thing that I've got a lot of is time. I've got a lot of time on my hands. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of thinking. Could that not be what this is worth? Let's say, you know, I wanted to trade with you. I would pay you one of these. Let's say that's worth two minutes of my time. I could then do whatever you wanted for two minutes. I could wash up. I could hoover up. I could play you at chess. That might have zero value for some people. They may not want two minutes of your time. You keep your own two minutes. So, I mean, do you think I should press ahead with this? Do you think I should 
create the IAU? Well, I think that uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, educational device for kindergarten students, grade one, it's a great idea. But whether or not this is going to be really successful and make uh, take off, uh, you've got too much competition right now. The people you're talking about, if they already have a the money, that what you're going to have to persuade them is that so the money, money is you're suggesting is better than what they've got. But like you say, the people, you know, they determine the demand. So, you know, I, I think that, that even though you've won a Nobel Prize, I think I might be right on this one because I think what I can do is I can ask my people, my citizens, to tell me that they want this. I can ask them to determine how much it's worth and to trade amongst themselves. If they don't already... Despite the professor's reservations, I decided to press ahead with my plans. If people were ever going to take my money seriously, it had to look the part. I did some more work on my designs and took them to the Bank of England to get their advice. The bank's chief cashier, Andrew Bailey, agreed to help me out. Hello, Hello, Hello Danny. Welcome Hi, to the Bank Danny. of England. It's nice good to, to meet you. you. How's it going? Good to meet you. I'm very well. Thanks Come for in. seeing me. You're welcome. I like your bank. Good. You want to buy it? No, no, no not, <laughs> not yet. We'll talk about that later. My bank note is called the uh, Interdependent Occupational Unit, or IOU. Right. I've got uh, <laughs> two designs. That's actually, if you look at that, my eyes and glasses. Wow. It does, doesn't it? Wow is the word. Yes. Um, this is more, more Aha, I've seen something like this before. More personal. I like the wig. Or is it a wig? Or is yeah, that's not a wig, it's actually... That's, a wig. Uh, that's your real hair, okay. Yeah, when it's, when it's humid. Yeah. Um, so here you've got, this is, look, that's my fingerprint. That's right. my thumbprint, so that's quite hard to, yes. to counterfeit. But how do your people recognise your thumbprint? How do I know that's really your signature? Indeed. Got you there. But on a kind of first impressions basis, what do you think of these two? Which one's your favourite? If you look at that one, it would not be very difficult for people to counterfeit that mm. one. And okay. what would that do to my economy? Well, if you went to a shop and they said, we're not accepting this because too many counterfeits looking like this are being passed to us, people would lose confidence in your currency. I would advise you not to go ahead with this. Not to go ahead with that? No. So, I mean, it seems to me that your favourite is obviously this one, the more sort of personal one, the more original one in, in many ways. Yes, but you want to distinguish it from other people's notes, so you wouldn't want it to look just like a Bank of England note. And frankly, no, definitely and nor not. Would and I think really want, that. want you to have it looking like a Bank of England note. Do you think that looks say, like a Bank of England note? If but it's going to be a problem, know, I can work on it. I can, you can uh, go along to your, um, your banknote printer and yeah. um, they'll come up with some designs for you. But it sounds like it's going to cost me about 50 quid just to print a tenner. No, each note uh, that we print costs us about 3p. 3p? Mm. I'll buy some off you. I was convinced I had the makings of a proper currency. I decided to put it to the test. Hi, can I pay my bill, please? Sure. That's £2.60. That's £2.60, OK. Um, there you go. That's great. Cheers. What's this? Sorry? That's... Uh, it's got it's the IOU. It's a new kind of currency. No. So what are you with it? It's worth about how much was the Guinness? Two sixty. It's worth about two sixty. Yeah. So that's cool, is it? Great. Okay. So that's fine. Thank you very much. Cheers. I was amazed. My fledgling currency had taken its first step. And with my money backed up by all the time I was sure my citizens would invest, I felt confident that one day the rest of the world would accept the IOU. If you'd like to find out how you can start earning IOUs, please visit citizensrequired.com. Or if you're a digital viewer, press red now where I'll be making a very special announcement live on Citizen TV.